The title of this message is Denying Christ. Denying Christ. We're going to look, we're going to look at the six times where Peter actually denied Christ. Jesus Christ. We're going to look at why Peter denied Christ, and we're going to look at Jesus' six responses for Peter's six denials of Christ. My goal in this message is to motivate you to actually do missions. Not to motivate you to give to missions, but to actually motivate you to do missions. To actually leave the country, preach the gospel, get people saved, Get them baptized, give them doctrine, and come, back, come on back and tell us about it. And hopefully that will help you in your pursuit to be rewarded or reigned with Christ so we deny Christ less. The first point I want to make out is Jesus, that Peter actually denied Jesus six times. Not three times, but six times. About five years ago, I did some in-depth study on the Gospels. My goal was to kind of map out where Jesus went on his journey. I tried to look at the places where he spoke, what he taught, the parables he taught, the, the miracles he did, and who was with him when he did those things. Well, because of that, I did a lot of cross-referencing between the four Gospels, so I did a lot of synchronizing between the four Gospels. And one thing that became apparent to me is that Peter denied Jesus more than three times. Right. A good proof of this is in Matthew 26. Matthew 26 gives us three accounts of Peter's denials. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. So there's one of his denials. Verse 71 mentions another denial. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus and Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. Here's another denial that he had. Verse 73 talks about a third denial. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. And then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. So here we have three denials. Where are they? Verse 57. Verse 57, they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. So Peter is at Caiaphas' palace and he denies Peter three times. Let's go to John chapter 18. The beautiful thing about the Gospels is oftentimes one of the Gospels will have a detail that the other three Gospels don't have. Great example is John chapter 18. John chapter 18 actually mentions one of Peter's denials, not in Caiaphas' palace, but in Annas' palace. Verse 13, John chapter 18, verse 13. And led him away to Annas first, the him is Jesus, and he was a father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Verse 15, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without, then went out the other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Verse 17, Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. So here we have Peter denying Jesus, and he's not at Caiaphas' palaces. So we have three at Caiaphas' palace, and we have one at Annas' palace. That's four denials. That's not three denials. That's four denials. Let's go to Mark chapter 14. Now, the interesting thing is, Jesus actually prophesied Peter's denials four times. He does in Matthew, he does in Mark, he does in Luke, and he does in John. And these are four independent prophecies, meaning they're just not a rehashing or rewording of the same prophecy. Two of those prophecies take place in the upper room during the Last Supper. Two of those prophecies take place on the Mount of Olives, which is a short time after the Last Supper. Luke chapter 22, verse 34, Jesus says, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt 
thrice deny that thou knowest me. A few seconds later, maybe a minute later, he says in John 13, 37, Verily I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Matthew chapter 26 is the Mount of Olives. And actually, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, the Mount of Olives. Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. So we see three similarities, similarities between these three prophecies. Jesus is basically saying, before a certain rooster, before a certain cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Now Mark has a unique Prophecy. Mark chapter 14, verse 30 says, Verily I say unto thee that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. There's a difference there. He talks about a cock crowing twice. Now, if you believe that God preserves his word, if you believe that King James Bible is a word perfect translation of God's word in the English language, in order for those four prophecies to be exact. In order for those four prophecies to be fulfilled, Jesus or Peter had to deny Jesus six times. Three times before the cock crows once, and three more times after the cock crows once before he, caught, he crows the second time. We're going to look at those six times. Now let's go to Matthew 26. Now, I already mentioned the first denial. The first denial is a John-only denial. We looked at John chapter 18. This is where he's at Annas' palace, and a damsel at the door says, Art now thou also one of this man's disciples? And he says, I am not. The second denial is reported by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69, we read it uh, actually twice already. We're going to read it a third time. This is Peter's second denial, verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. Now Matthew tells us that Peter was sitting down at Caiaphas' palace. Mark gives us a detail saying that he was sitting down warming himself. Luke gives us a detail that the servants of the high priest, they actually assembled a fire in the midst of, of the hallway. And Mark tells us that Peter was actually beneath Jesus. He was in the room above uh, Jesus. Now, Matthew tells us that a, a damsel comes up to uh, Peter and says, Thou also was with Jesus of, Na of Galilee. Mark gives us a little more detail. The damsel in Mark tells us, and thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. So Mark adds three words, and of Nazareth. And the Luke tells us that the damsel actually spoke to a group and said, this man was also with him. Now obviously a damsel spoke all of those words. Obviously she spoke all those phrases. But when you put them together, it makes a lot of sense. This damsel actually walked up to Peter as he's sitting in a group, and she says, this man was also with him. Then she turns to Peter and says, and thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth of Galilee. What was Peter's response? According to Matthew, he says, he says uh, I know not what thou sayest. Mark gives us a little more detail. He gives us two more words. I know not, neither understand what thou sayest. Luke tells us that he says, woman, I know her not. So when you take these three phrases, he literally said to the woman, woman, I know I'm not. I understand not what thou sayest. That's a second denial. Now let's go to uh, Mark chapter 14. Now the third denial is a John only denial. The third denial takes place in John chapter 18, verse 25. And this is where uh, uh, Peter is at Caiaphas' house. And John tells us that he stood himself up to warm himself. So denial number two, he's sitting in a group warming his hands or whatever. And then he stands up to warm himself. And then a man from the group says to him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? And he says, I am not. Now the fourth denial is reported by Matthew and Mark. But before the fourth denial, Mark tells us in Mark chapter 14, 68, that, Jesus, that Peter actually went down out to a porch. When he went out to the porch, that's when the cock crew. Mark chapter 14, verse 68. 
But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. So after the third denial, Peter goes out in the porch and hears the cock crow. So we have three denials and the cock crowing. That's a fulfillment of Luke chapter 22, verse 34, when Jesus says, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. That's a fulfillment of John 13, 37, verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. That's a fulfillment in Matthew 26, verse 34. Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou should deny me thrice. Three denials, one cock crowing. Now, the fourth denial is reported by Matthew and Mark. Matthew tells us that Peter, while he's on the porch, a mate, another maid sees him and says to the group, says to the group, Mark says the same thing, that Peter is on the porch and another maid sees him. What does the maid say? According to Matthew, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. According to Mark, she says, this is one of them. So what did the woman say? She says, this is one of them. This fellow also was, was with Jesus of Nazareth. What did Peter say? I do not know the man. So that's the fourth denial, I do not know the man. Now, the fifth denial is actually a Luke-only denial. The fifth denial is Luke 22, verse 58. And after a little while, uh, Luke tells us that a man approaches Peter and says, Thou art also of them. And Peter's response is, Man, I am not. The sixth denial is actually a pretty complicated one. It's reported of all, of, of all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. According to Matthew, Matthew tells us that after a while came unto him they that stood by. So after a while, a group comes to Peter, and then according to Mark, it says, and a little after, they that stood by said to Peter. Luke tells us about a, about a space of an hour. So about an hour after his fifth denial, a group comes up to Peter, and what do they say? Well, one of the men says, surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Another man spoke, speaks up, or another person says, surely thou art also one of them, for thou art a Galilean for thy speech agreeeth thereto. Another person says, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Another person says, Did I not see thee in the garden with him? What did Peter say? According to Matthew, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. What did Mark say? I know not this man of whom ye speak, and the second time the cock crew. Crew, according to Luke, man, I know not what thou sayest, and immediately while he spake, the cock crew. According to John, Peter denied again, and immediately the cock crew. So basically, G Peter looks at a man and says, I know not what thou sayest. Then he speaks to the group and says, I, I know not the man, this man of whom ye speak. So there's six denials. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. So the sixth denial is the first denial. Peter says, I am not, referring to I am not a disciple. The second denial, he says to the woman, I know him not, neither understand what thou sayest. The third denial, he says, I am not. The fourth denial, he says, I do not know the man. The fifth denial, I man, I am not. The sixth denial, he speaks to a group, says, man, I know not what thou sayest. I know not the man, this man of whom ye speak. Six denials. Now, why would Peter deny Jesus? Well, why would anybody deny Jesus? 2 Timothy chapter 2 gives us some good doctrine on that. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12 says, If we suffer, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Us. The Bible says if we want to reign with Christ, what does it mean to reign with Christ? It means to, to receive great rewards, to have great positions of honor in the millennial reign of Christ. If we want to reign with Christ, it's not talking about salvation. It's talking about reigning or having great rewards. If we want to reign with Christ, we must suffer with him. Now, people who do not want to suffer with him, what do they do? They deny him. Notice this verse juxtaposes suffering for Christ Versus denying him. If we suffer, we also shall reign with him. 
If we deny him, he also will deny us. What does that mean that he's going to deny us? He's going to, he's going to deny us great rewards. He's going to deny us great positions of authority in the millennial reign of Christ. So there's a strong correlation between suffering for Christ versus denying Christ. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Pastor Romero of Steadfast Baptist Church, he preached a real strong message last week called Peter's Denial. He basically looked at various characteristics of Peter to try to explain why he denied Christ. He looked at characteristics. One of the characteristics of Peter is he's quick to speak. He's quick to act. For a while, he did not like hard preaching. He liked prosperity-only preaching. And maybe some of these characteristics helped contribute why he actually denied Christ. But the bottom line, according to Pastor Romero, was he was afraid. He feared. He did not want to suffer for Christ. And Pastor Romero looked at Philippians chapter 129. I feel this fits in beautifully with this doctrine. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. God expects all saved people to actually suffer for his sake. Amen. The Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We are called to suffer for Christ's sake. And you know, I think that's, uh, you know, Pastor Burson can definitely testify to this. About seven and a half years ago, Faith the Word Baptist Church had a lot of persecution. Uh, mainly because of preaching against the Sodomites, preaching against Barack Obama and so forth. There was a particular Sunday where we had about 100 protesters outside our church, and we had maybe 10 or 15 cameras right in front of the church door. We had reporters out there. So people who were coming into church, they were kind of barraged by reporters, cameras, and so forth. And then when they walked out of church, the reporters followed them out to their cars, asking them questions, and so forth. This was difficult for a few people. We actually did lose some key people. Not because they disagreed with the preaching. Not because they disagreed they did not like the fellowship. Not because they disagreed with the soul winning. Because they did not want to suffer for Christ's sake. There was a young man who kind of touched my heart. He was a new uh, person in our church. He's probably about 22 or 23 years old. He's one of these Alex Jones types. He was really into the truth movement. Well, he came into our church because of an Alex Jones interview. And when he got to the church, he got saved. He absolutely loved the preaching. And a week before all this happened, he said, I'm actually learning the truth. I've been lied to in church all these years. I'm actually learning the truth. And he just loved it. He was coming three times a week and so forth. Well, when all this happened, he just freaked out. See, he was a bug guy. He brought his work truck into, you know, to church, and he was paranoid that the cameras were going to show his work truck. He was going to get some persecution at, at work and so forth, and he left, and he never returned. We did lose some people because they didn't want to suffer for Christ's sake. So basically, they were denying Faith the Word Baptist Church. They were denying Pastor Stephen Anderson. They were basically saying, I am not a disciple of Christ. Uh, woman, I know not him, neither understand what thou sayest. They were basically saying, I am not a disciple of Stephen Anderson. I do not know the man Stephen Anderson. Man, I am not a member of that church. Man, I know not what thou sayest. I know not the man, this man of whom ye speak. That's a great example of someone who was not willing to suffer for Christ, and he denied Christ, or he denied a church that I believe that Jesus feels very strongly about. About nine months ago, Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento went through something very similar. There was a particular Sunday about nine months ago where there were about 500 protesters outside of the church. And on this particular Sunday, the people who went to church, they literally had to walk through a gauntlet of about 500 people, and they were screamed at while they walked up to church and while they walked out. My understanding is that Pastor Jimenez, he lost some key people. Why? Not because they disagreed with his preaching. Not because they did not like the fellowship. Not because they disagreed with the soul wanting. Because they did not want to suffer for Christ's sake. And because of that, they denied Verity Baptist Church. They denied a man of God. They were basically saying, I am not a Christian. Women, I know not him. Neither understand 
what thou sayest. I am not a member of Verity Baptist Church. I do not know the man, Pastor Jimenez. Man, I am not a member of Pastor Jimenez's church. Man, I know not what thou sayest. I know not the man, this man of whom ye speak. That's another great example of someone who's not willing to suffer for Christ's sake. So he denied a church that I believe Jesus really likes. He denied a man of God I believe that Jesus really likes. And he then people backed away. I would imagine the reason why Peter denied Jesus six times was because he did not want to suffer for Christ's sake. When we deny Jesus, it's because we don't want to suffer for Christ's sake. I would imagine the reason why Peter went fishing instead of going soul winning is because he did not want to suffer for Christ's sake. Obviously, you don't lose your salvation, but you do lose rewards from Christ. You lose your opportunities to reign with Christ. Like I said before, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, if we suffer, we also shall reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Us. He will deny rewards from us. He will deny us from reigning in his kingdom, having great positions of authority. Okay, let's go to Peter, Jesus' six responses. Let's go to John chapter 20. Now what's interesting is Peter, you know, Jesus actually appears to Peter and addresses Peter six times after Peter's six denials. The first time is John chapter 20. This is the first day of Jesus' resurrection. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, uh, for fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Let's go to Mark chapter 16. So Peter's, you know, Jesus' response to Peter's first denial, he's saying, go. He's saying, I send you as the Father sent me. What did Jesus do? He preached the gospel. He ministered to people. As you're turning to Mark chapter 16, I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 also talks about the first day of Jesus' resurrection. And he says that repentance, remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So, so Jesus' response to Peter's first now is he's saying, go soul winning, do evangelism, go. Go and preach the gospel. The second time that Jesus appears to uh, Peter is during Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, this occurs according to John eight days after Jesus' resurrection. This is Jesus' second appearance unto his disciples. How do you know that it's uh, eight days after the resurrection? Verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven. Now, Jesus' first day of his resurrection, Thomas was not there according to John. So the eleven were not there when Peter showed up, when uh, Jesus showed up. So here we see in verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven. John tells us on the eighth day of Jesus' resurrection, the eleven are gathered. Thomas is gathered. So this tells me that this is eight days after the resurrection. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So what's, Peter's second what's Jesus' second response to Peter's second denial? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. His response is, Preach the gospel. Do evangelism. Let's go to the third appearance. Jesus' third appearance to him. Let's go to uh, John chapter 21. John chapter 21 is Jesus' third appearance unto his disciples. This is while they're fishing. John chapter 21, verse 14, now, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So this is the third time that 
Jesus appears to John. Verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto them, feed my lambs. So Jesus' third response to Peter's third denial is he's saying, feed my lambs. What does it mean to feed uh, Jesus' lambs? It means to disciple new believers. Disciple new believers. Verse 16, he saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. What's a sheep? It's an adult. So what's he telling them? He's telling them to the disciple adults, disciple mature Christians. Again, verse 17, he saith unto the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto them, feed my sheep. So he's driving it again, disciple mature believers. Go to Matthew chapter 28. So Jesus' response to the third, fourth, and fifth denial is a response of discipleship. Disciple new believers. Disciple mature believers. Disciple mature believers. Matthew chapter 28 is referred to as the Great Commission. This is the fourth time that Jesus appears unto his disciples, and this is going to be his sixth response to Peter. Matthew chapter 28, verse... 16, then the eleven disciples went and went into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed him. Now notice that they're in Galilee, they're not in Judea, they're not in Jerusalem, they're in Galilee, and notice that they're in a mountain. Now when I mapped out Jesus' journey throughout Galilee, I noticed that there's only one high mountain that he went to in Galilee. It's a mount of transfiguration. He takes, he takes his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to the mount of transfiguration. They see him in his full glory. They see Moses and Elisha. They hear the voice of God. It's a very powerful experience. My guess is he's probably with his disciples on top of the mount of transfiguration. That's my guess. Verse 16 again. Then the eleven disciples went away in Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed him. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. What did they doubt? Definitely not the resurrection. They've already seen him three times. They've already had multiple meals with him. What did they doubt? I bet a lot of them doubted what they were looking at. My guess is Jesus came out in his full glory. He probably came out as transfigured status, and they're probably wondering, what are we looking at? I think it was a powerful sermon illustration, because look at what Jesus said, verse 18. All power is given unto me. I think that would be pretty fitting for Jesus to come out in his full transfigured status and say, all power is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then he follows up with, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So what's Jesus' sixth response to Peter's sixth denial? He's saying, missions, leave the country, preach the gospel, get people saved, get them baptized, teach them doctrine. That's his sixth response. So when you look at Jesus' sixth response is to uh, Peter's sixth denials, two of them are evangelistic based, Three of them are disciple-based, and one of them is missions-based. I think that's a great blueprint on how churches should be run. I think that would be a great model for churches to be heavily involved with soul winning, heavily involved with discipleship, discipling new believers, mature believers, and heavily involved with missions. Why does he teach this? I think this is a good way to prevent us from denying Christ, to prevent us from getting to the point where we don't want to suffer Christ. I would imagine people who do a lot of soul winning, they're probably less likely to deny Christ. I would imagine a lot of people who do a lot of discipleship, they're probably less likely to deny Christ. I would imagine a lot of people who are involved heavily in missions, they're probably less likely to deny Christ. This would be a great blueprint for churches to follow. I would bet a lot of churches who don't do a lot of soul winning are probably more prone to deny Christ. They're more prone to fear to serve Christ. They're more prone to deny Christ or to deny him and fear to follow him. I would imagine a lot of churches who do not do a good job discipling new believers. What's an example of a new believer? Kids, you know, little children. 
Little children are new believers. And let me tell you something. There's a lot of churches out there that not only don't do a whole lot of soul winning, but there's a lot of churches out there who don't do a good job discipling new believers or children. Let me tell you something. I believe very strongly against kids' church. I used to be a youth pastor. I used to you know, teach children Sunday school. I used to t- teach you know, VBS, Vacation Bible Study. I tell you what, those curriculums are so bad, there were times I had to rewrite the entire curriculum just to try to line it up to a church. We were at a church in Guyana. We visited an independent fundamental Baptist church, and they had a, an adult church, and they had a kid's church. There's about 130 people in the kid's church. One of the people in our group, we went down, he went down to check out kid's church. Well, the preacher was actually preaching about Adam and Eve. But he wasn't reading the Bible. He was reading a storybook about Adam and Eve. And what was his teaching? He was saying that Adam and Eve, they took it easy in the garden. They never had a work. They they never did any work. It was easy for them. They always had vacation. It was easy for them. Wouldn't that be great? That's not a teaching of the Bible. (laughs) That's not a teaching that came out of the Bible. That's a false teaching. Let me tell you something. There's a big difference between the guy who teaches behind the pulpit in adult church versus the woman or the person standing in front of the blackboard serving fruit juice or cookies to kids reading out of a storybook. A lot of churches do not do a good job discipling new believers or do a good job discipling children. And I would imagine a lot of these churches who have kids' church they probably deny Christ. They're probably afraid to follow Christ, and they deny Christ. We have a lot of churches today where they actually send their bright 18-year-olds and their 19-year-olds off to Bible college. They don't do a good job discipling mature believers, so they send them off to Bible college. About two years ago, Pastor Anderson preached a strong message condemning Baptist preachers, saying, you're the reason why the Sodomites have gotten so strong. You're the reason why the Sodomites have gained so much momentum. And the reason why is because a lot of Baptist preachers back down from the Sodomites. And the reason why they back down is they're afraid to follow Christ. And he was saying, he, he did a call out to all Baptist preachers. He said, if you're not strong enough to say that they're vile, perverse, reprobate, worthy of death, you need to step down. You're part of the problem. Now, that really convicted me because at that time, uh, I had been donating some money to the missions fund. I had been donating money to three missionaries, and I thought to myself, I wonder if these three guys are part of the problem. I wonder if these guys are actually, you know, have the guts to say they're vile, perverse, reprobate, worthy of death. So I tried to do a little research on them. Well, the first two guys, I couldn't find any preaching from them at all. So I wasn't sure where they were at. You know, this, if they were part of the problem or not. The third guy actually had a very big church, and it looked like he had a pretty wealthy church. At that time, his church was bigger than my church. So I'm thinking, why am I sending money to him? He ought to be sending money to us. And so I actually found a, a, an updated letter, and he was praising God that his, um, his son just graduated from Bible college. He sent his son overseas into Texas. He sent him for four years of Bible college, and he was graduating. Now the son was coming back. Well, the thought was going through my mind, why is he sending his son to Bible college? Why doesn't he just disciple himself? And, it, and what's even more interesting is the son was coming back to be his youth pastor. And my thought was, why does, he, why does he just train his own youth pastor? Why does he have to send someone off to Bible college and you'll rack up that kind of debt flying back and forth to get his own youth pastor? So that raised a lot of questions in my eyes. It's like, why, who's paying for that? Who's paying for that tuition? Who's paying for those airfares and so forth? Well, I did have a chance to check out the guy's preaching. I didn't see any sermons on sodomites at all. It seems that a lot of churches who don't do a good job soul winning, a lot of churches who don't do a good job, you know, raising up new believers, a lot of children, a lot of churches don't do a good job training mature believers seem to have a great tendency to deny Christ, who are afraid to stand up for Christ, who actually deny Christ and are afraid to suffer for Christ. And that really touched my heart. It's like, wow. There are a lot, very few people who are willing to stand up to Christ, you know, stand up for Christ. There's a lot of people who are denying Christ. What does this mean for us believers? We ought to be soul winners. We ought to do a good job discipling new believers. What's a new believer? A great example would be a parent training his or, you know, their kids 
about, you know, about the Lord Jesus Christ. A, a great example of discipling mature believers is when a husband trains his wife, reads the Bible to her, and teaches the Bible to her. Those are great examples. I would imagine people who do a lot of soul winning, people who train their kids as well as new believers, people who train mature believers are probably less likely to deny Christ. They're less fearful to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They're less fearful to deny Christ. Christ. The final piece, and this is what I want to emphasize, is the final response that Jesus gave was do missions. Now, notice he didn't say in Matthew 28, 19 to give to missions. Notice he didn't say go out and feed the poor. Now, a lot of churches, that's their missions. They'll send a check off for $100 to a particular missionary. They'll send uh, maybe feed the poor and so forth. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with sending the missionary money. There's nothing wrong with feeding the poor. But that's not what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 28 and 19. He said, go into all the world, go into and teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. He's telling his disciples, leave the country, preach the gospel, get people saved, Get them baptized and teach them doctrine. And when you look at churches who do that, who actually are proactive in those types of activities, they're probably less likely to deny Christ. They're probably less fearful to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, about seven months ago, Pastor Anderson is really shaking up the missionary field. About six or seven months ago, he sent a team off to Botswana. Botswana is in the southern region of Africa. And about 20 soul winners went to Botswana. And in a matter of a few days, in a matter of a, a few weeks, and even thereafter, they made a huge impact. I would imagine the Botswana pit, uh, push, there was probably about 1,000 people saved through door-to-door -door soul winning. At least two schools were preached the gospel. At least one police station, the gospel was preached. Those 20 people have done an amazing work for God. And the, the numbers that we got on Botswana is you knock five doors, you get four people saved. The people in Botswana are very receptive. Those of you who do so, a lot of soul winning in America, you're probably licking your chops and saying, man, I wish I could knock five doors and get four people saved. The people were very receptive there. And people who got saved there, they actually showed up to church. I will bet a lot of you guys, it looks like you got 35 people saved this year so far. I bet a lot of you would love to see those people show up to church. A high percentage of people show up to church. And there might have been maybe 20% of the people actually showed up to our church service that we actually got saved. That's very receptive. And when you talk to that team of 20 people, a lot of them will tell you the same thing. That was the most powerful experience in my life. That was the greatest experience in my life. Uh, myself, I, uh, I was only there for three days. Myself, I got to uh, go soul winning one day. I knocked three doors, got three salvations. Door number one, got them saved. Door number two, got them saved. Door number three, got them saved. That's never happened to me before. That was you know, a wonderful experience. And then the second day I was there, or the third day I was there, I actually got to preach the gospel at a public school. I went to a public high school, preached the gospel to over 600 kids. Now, I don't have a whole lot of preaching experience, but by far that was the most awesome preaching experience I've ever experienced. It was a lot of fun just going to another country, preaching the gospel, getting people saved, getting people baptized, and teaching them doctrine. A short time after that, we actually got to go to Malawi. Malawi is also a country in Africa. It's actually considered the poorest country in the world. My wife and I, we got to go soul winning with there. We actually got to uh, train two local pastors soul winning. So the four of us, over uh, about 10 days, we got 176 people saved. That's a very conservative number. If the numbers in Botswana was five doors, four salvations, the numbers in Malawi is probably like four doors, four salvations, or four, or four doors and seven salvations. There was a time we went out soul winning, we broke from prayer. I walked about 10 feet and a passerby walked by me. I stopped him. He wanted to hear the gospel. So we went underneath a mango tree in the shade. I gave him the gospel. Before I was done, another man lined up behind him. So after I preached the gospel to this guy, 
I got the second guy of the gospel. While I'm talking to this guy, two more guys lined up. So now I have a little line to hear the gospel. I'm standing under the same mango tree. I haven't even knocked one door yet. And I got four, I gave the gospel presentation four times underneath the shade of this mango tree. After that, I finally walked 20 feet and knocked my first door. There were three women selling mangoes in front of their house. I gave them the gospel. By the time I was done, I had a group of 30 people around me wanting to hear the gospel. The unusual thing about Malawi, I truly do believe this might be the most receptive area in the world. These people fear God and it's the poorest poorest country in the world. And those of you who do a lot of soul winning, those are the two ingredients you need. People who fear God and people who don't have a whole lot of money. And the unique thing about Malawi is you preach the gospel there, you've got a group of people around you just wanting to hear. So here I am preaching the gospel at my first door. i got like 30 people around me wanting to hear the gospel. The last day we went soul winning, I think, was the most special day. My wife, she broke from prayer, and she walked about 10 feet, and she gave a 40-year-old woman the gospel, got her saved. Right after that, a couple young men walked up. She got them saved. She had to walk. She still had to knock her first door. After that, she got an older man saved. Then she walked up to three men who were on a work break. She got them saved. She had really only walked about 20 feet. And then after that, a crippled woman came up to my wife. This woman, she couldn't walk. She was literally walking on her hands. She put her hands in a pair of shoes to protect her hands, and she was crawling on her hands. Her legs were dragging behind her. My wife, she got her saved. After that, then just droves and droves of people came to my wife. She was sitting down. I came to my wife at the end of that soul winning time, and she literally had, she was giving the gospel to six people, and there were 70 people around her. She had gotten a man saved two days before, and he was her translator. So this guy was standing on a boulder, and while my wife was giving the gospel, he was yelling out at the top of his lungs the gospel, so there were 70 people standing around hearing the gospel. We have no idea how many people got saved. My wife counted 12, just to be ultra-conservative, but there's a good chance of 50 to maybe 100 people got saved just on that day of soul winning. It truly was a very powerful experience. The best soul winning I've ever done. You know, when you leave the country, when you preach the gospel, you experience some wonderful things. A couple months ago, Pastor Anderson went to Guyana. He took a small group of people, and they went for only like two or three days. I don't know how many people they got saved, but it might have been like 50 or, or, or so people. But Pastor Anderson, he got to preach the gospel in a school. He preaches gospel in a government school to over 600 people. Now, he's done a lot of preaching. He's been a lot of venues. He's preached in a lot of churches, conferences, and so forth. And he said, by far, that was the most rewarding preaching experience he's ever had. Well, about a month or two after that, he sent a larger offensive there. It was about a 40 or 50 days long. Multiple people, multiple people went down there. We preached at a lot of schools. I would say we probably got about 800 people saved, door-to-door -door soul winning. The numbers in Guyana was uh, you knock two doors, you get someone saved. You knock two doors, you get someone saved. And the interesting thing about Guyana is it's a melting pot, a help melting pot of religion. There's a lot of uh, Hindus there. 25% of the population is Hindu. There's a lot of Muslims there as well. We actually got Hindus saved. We got Muslims saved. We got Seventh-day Adventists saved, Mormons saved, and so forth. It really showed me just how powerful the gospel is. If people are willing to listen to it, I tell you what, I got Hindus saved. They knew hardly anything about Jesus. They didn't know about his deity. They knew very little, if anything, about you know, the resurrection. I had to spend a few more minutes with them, but they got it. One gospel presentation, and they left Hinduism, and they got saved. There was a time where I actually walked up to a door. My soul winning up. Bible is actually bilingual. It's Spanish and English. And, you know, that's what you need in Arizona. You need a Spanish and English Bible. Well, I almost didn't take it to Guyana because I heard that nobody speaks Spanish there. Well, it just so happened I knocked on a door, and this family, they moved from Venezuela, and they basically only spoke Spanish. So it was fortunate that I had my Spanish-speaking Bible. Now, the woman, she knew a lot of English. I got her saved in English. And I said, well, what about your husband? Because he's standing right over there. And, and, and she said, well, he doesn't speak English. 
I said, well, my Bible's in Spanish. Why don't you translate? So we got him saved. And then we came back the next day, got her sister saved, and we gave the gospel to another person in that, in that, you know, home, in that home. And believe it or not, this was a Hindu family because they had their Hindu flags out. Hindus, they have a bunch of flags in their yard and so forth. So here we have a group of people who got saved in a third language, you know, through the gospel, the power of the gospel. It truly was a wonderful experience. I got to preach at two schools. Uh, a young man by the name of Charlie Jeffries from our church, he came on down. Charlie Jeffries, he's been attending the preaching class of Pastor Anderson. He's only gone two or three times. He's uh, preached maybe two or three uh, sermons, about five minutes long. He got the opportunity to preach in two schools, 20-minute sermons, to over 600 kids. You know, there was a, uh, Pastor Anderson took eight people down with them recently. They got to preach in schools. They got to get people saved. I would say 11,000 people, 11,000 high school students heard the gospel. They got preached the gospel. What a powerful experience. It truly is a great testimony that, you know, truly the harvest is plentiful. We just need more workers in the harvest field. You know, the... Uh, these types of things are going to continue on. I believe there's actually 30 days from now we're going to Malawi. About 25 people are going to Malawi. I believe this is probably going to be the greatest experience for these people. I think I'm the only person on the payroll. I think I'm the only person who's, be, you know, who's actually getting paid to go there. These are people who work their jobs, they ask for time off, and they're paying their way to Malawi. And you say, well, what does it cost for something like that? A round trip ticket to Malawi is $1,300. Uh, a week's worth of hotel is probably about $200. The food is a little cheaper here, and the daily transportation about 5 or $6 a day. Well, you know, we live in a society where people will go to an exotic place to play golf. Or they'll go to an exotic place to go scuba diving. Or they'll go to an exotic place to go to safari. You know, we need to get the mindset that maybe we ought to go on our vacations to an exotic place to preach the gospel, to preach in the high schools, to preach door to door. To, to knock five doors, get four people saved. To knock five doors, get seven people saved. Knock no doors and just give the gospel over and over to these people who are in desperate need of it. It truly, it can be a powerful experience. I know Guyana is going to happen again. Pastor Anderson wants to preach to every single high school in Guyana. Well, that's about 90 more high schools. That's about 50 or 60,000 people. We need people to go down there who know how to preach the gospel, to go down there, be willing to stand in front of 600 kids who are hungry to hear and get people saved and preach the gospel to people. The, you know, the, the harvest truly is plentiful. We just need people to think about that. So the sixth response to Peter's, to Peter's sixth denial is go into all the world, Preach the gospel. Go into all, into all nations and preach the gospel. Get them saved. Get them baptized. Get them full of doctrine. That's a powerful thing. I would imagine people who are active in missions are probably less likely to deny Christ. People who are active in missions are probably people who are going to do great works for Christ. who are going to be more able to rule and reign with Christ and less likely to deny Christ. Christ. The title of this message is Denying Christ. We, look at, uh, we looked at uh, Peter's six denials of Christ. We look at, looked at why Peter denied Christ. Why did he deny Christ? Because he was fearful. He did not want to suffer for Christ. We looked at uh, Jesus' six responses to Peter's six denials. Two of them are soul winning oriented. Three of them are discipleship oriented. And one of them is missions oriented. So my prayer for you guys is Think considerably, think seriously to leave this nation, preach the gospel, get people saved, get them baptized, get them some doctrine, and come on back and tell people about it. You, know, you can do it cost effectively for a week or two, and it'll probably be the greatest experience you've ever had, and you'll probably be less likely to deny Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, I thank you, for God, for this opportunity to preach your word, Lord. Lord, I pray that this will, uh, I thank you, God, for this congregation. I thank you for the hunger here for soul winning. And Lord, I pray that I will see uh, members of this congregation preach the gospel at schools, preach the gospel door to door in countries that maybe they even never even heard of before and get a lot of people saved that they've never seen before. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.